If you'll just turn with me in your Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and then we'll be announcing a few other scriptures as we go. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to read verses 14 through 17. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet Savior of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savior of death unto death, and to the other, the savior of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. There are five unmistakable marks of, of true Christianity and you cannot imitate them. Either you're a true Christian, and, have, and you, if you are, you will have these marks. They cannot be imitated. The true Christian life begins with a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, the hour in which we are living, there are so many that are false teachers, false prophets. They're out trying to teach people. There are many ways to get to heaven. There are many ways, not just the one way. Folks, the Bible teaches us differently. The Bible teaches us the truth. True Christian life begins with a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to get our lives changed and prepared for heaven. It cannot be otherwise. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. He that hath the Son of God hath light, life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Until a person responds to the promise of Christ and receives him as Lord, there is no possibility of everlasting life. I'm sharing this with you tonight because, and as I said, in the hour which we are living, there are many false prophets that are trying to pull people away trying to get them to join their way. You're going to run into people, especially as you begin to share Jesus Christ, as you begin to become a witness and a, of your testimony, you're going to be, meet people that believe this way. And they're going to say, oh no, there's other ways to heaven. You're, you're wrong. You, you, there's just many ways to heaven. The Bible tells us the way to heaven. Okay. The five marks of a true Christian that I want to speak to you about tonight have nothing to do with personality or temperament. They are attainable by anyone who discovers their secret. Let's look again at 2 Corinthians verses 2 to Second uh, Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. Now thanks be unto God <clears throat> which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. If we are a true believer, a true Christian, no matter where you are, no matter who you are around, they're going to know that there's something different about you. You don't act like other people do. You're joyful, you're happy, you're at peace. There's just something about the way that you live. Some people are going to notice and ask you, what is it about you? You're different. What's, what's going on in your life? What makes you so happy? You never seem down or discouraged. That's when we, we're putting off that savor of Jesus. People are seeing Jesus in us. Okay. <clears throat> True Christianity is a thankful life, even in the midst of trials and difficulty. It is a kind of unquenchable optimism. We see it clearly in the book of Acts. 
A note of triumph runs through from the beginning to the end. Now I ask you to consider what I've just said. If you've read the book of Acts, and I'm convinced that, almost, that every one of us sitting in this sanctuary tonight have read the book of Acts, we know that there were ups and downs. There was a time when the church was just mar moving out and conquering and, and moving out ahead and growing. And then there were times when opposition would come, trouble would come. Paul and Silas, look at them. Peter, cast into prison. James, killed. It isn't always a bed of roses. There are times when struggles come, when problems come, when situations cause pain and suffering, sickness comes. But hear me, true Christianity is a thankful life. Even in the midst of trials and difficulties, we are still thankful and giving thanks to God for the blessings that he bestows upon us, for the peace that give, even in the midst of trouble, God gives a special peace that comes deep from within. And we just live with it and share it. Okay. We see it clearly, as I said, through the book of Acts. Despite the dangers, the hardships, the persecution, and the perils, the early Christians, all that they experienced, they still proclaimed Jesus. They never backed down. They never tired out. They continued to share Jesus. That same note of thanksgiving is reflected in all of Paul's letters. The epistles, the Apostle Paul, you will see that same note of thanksgiving. Paul, and if sometime I would encourage you to take time and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. Paul explains all the things. His, he was being questioned. There were some that tell, was telling him, you're not really an apostle. You're not an apostle. So he was having to kind of defend his position. And he began to tell all the things that he had gone through. But in the midst of it all, I asked one time as I was reading the life, and I've studied the life of Paul. He's one of my favorite of the Bible characters. I have several books in my office about the life of Paul. And I asked the question to myself one time as I was reading all the things he was going through. I said, what is it? What is it about the Apostle Paul? What, what causes him to get up and keep going? Like at the time of Philippi, where he was stoned and took outside the city and left for dead. When the disciples stood around him, Paul got up. What did he do? He didn't tell them, let's get out of here, let's go to another place. No. He turned and went right back into the same city and continued preaching the gospel. What made him do that? What made him keep going after all those expenses? the true joy of salvation, the true joy of knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, knowing him, that peace that only God can give. I want to share two areas of that peace tonight, just standing with you tonight. The peace of God, Philippians 4, the peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding that will guard our hearts and guard our minds. That's one of the reasons that we can keep going in the midst of trouble, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of loss. God gives us a spatial peace. And all of you that are true believers tonight have that peace right now. There's going to be times when things happen, that peace is just going to just be there and you'll feel it welling up within you. He guards our hearts and our, our guards our mind. The second piece, Jesus, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The peace that God gives us is a lasting peace. It's a perfect peace. It keeps us going at all times. 
So a true Christian is thankful, is, th is thankful of life even in the midst of difficulty. It is a kind of unquenchable optimism. We see it clearly, as I said, in the book of Acts. I encourage you, let's take time and reread the book of Acts. Read it slowly. Meditate upon it. See what the Lord would say, it, say to us. Despite the dangers, the hardships, the persecution, and the perils that the early Christians experienced, that same note of thanksgiving is reflected in all of Paul's letters, as well as those of Peter, James, and John. The true Christians feel all the pain, hurt, and adverse circumstances as much as anyone else. Okay. We feel the same things. Those that are unsaved, that are not believers, they go through the same kind of trials and testings. It pulls them down. Some commit suicide. Break, it breaks up marriages. What's the difference between the Christian and the non-believer? When the Christian goes through these trials, he stays true to God. What's the difference? The peace of God. The peace of God that always causes us to triumph, that true peace of God. But the true Christian knows the same Lord who per perform permitted the pain to come will use us to bring about highly desirable end. What does he tell us in Romans chapter 8, 20 thing? But all things were together for good to them that are the called of God. He didn't, just, he didn't say just the good things. He said all things work together for the good to them that are the called of God. That peace comes into action. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas in jail at Philippi is a prime example of what we are talking about tonight. Think of them. They were preaching the gospel. They're taken and beaten. Their clothes stripped off and they're beaten. 39 stripes across their backs. Deep wounds, pain, blood running off of them. And they're taken and shoved into prison. Chains put on their arms, holding them to the walls. Pain and suffering. Nobody seemed to care at all. Nobody took time to clean up their wounds or to help them in any way. But what happens? Did they, did they look at each other and say, what got us into this mess? Why are we doing what we're doing if this is going to be the end? Folks, don't think it's strange when I say that to you. I've had individuals come to me, pastor, why has this happened? If this is what Christianity is all about, I don't need it. And turn and walk away. Paul and Silas could have said the same thing, but they didn't. The Bible says at the midnight hour, the midnight hour when, when say, things seem to be the worst, they begin to sing praises to God. They lifted their voices so that everyone in the prison could hear them singing and praising God in the midst of their problem, reaching out in praise and worship to God. Praise Him. Praise Him. Can we do that? When we're going through trials, when we're going through brokenness, when there seems to be no end to the pain and suffering? Folks, we can do it. God gives us the strength. My wife sitting here on the front row tonight in horrible pain in her hands, no feeling whatsoever. At night, if you look at her right now, she's got gloves on because she has to try to keep her hands warm. That helps the pain. Suffer sometimes, she can't even hold on to anything. But she's never turned back. She's never blamed God. She's never said, I don't want to be a Christian. She keeps praising. She keeps praying. She keeps believing. She's not the only one. Look at Richard Forrest really understand what Richard's gone through. And yet, every day, 
Richard wakes up praising the Lord, believing God, maybe this is going to be the day. Jim, who takes him to the dialysis Mondays and Fridays, Jim can tell you the condition that Richard is in over and over. But he keeps hanging on. He keeps believing God, trusting and praising God. He wants to talk about God. He hasn't given up. And he won't give up because his faith is locked in to God. Okay. Now, when Paul and Silas were in prison, midnight hour singing and praise, they had no idea, no thought that there was going to be an earthquake to open the prison. All they wanted to do was just keep praising the Lord. Can you imagine what it must have been like when that earthquake came? The prison doors are all bro broke open. The chains fall off. But not one prisoner left the prison. Why? God. God. Paul and Silas were in prison for one reason. For one reason. When that jailer come running in, he was ready to commit suicide because he's afraid if the prisoners are gone, he knew what would happen to him. Paul cries out, do yourself no harm. We are all here. He calls for a light. He looks in, he sees them all. He says to Paul, he takes Paul and Silas out, takes them home, cleans them up, feeds them. And the first thing out of his mouth as they come out of the prison is, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? That was the reason Paul and Silas went through what they did. The Lord knew there's one family that would surrender to him. The jailer and all of his family accepted Jesus Christ and were baptized that same night. Can we sing in an hour of brokenness? Can we sing in a time of true pain and suffering? So I want to remind you again tonight. The second thing of the five is unvarying success which always causes us to triumph. The scripture that I read for, to you this evening tells us the Lord always causes us to triumph. We go through problems. We go through circumstances that we seem to think that there's no end. In God's time, he ends it and causes us to triumph. Gives us victory over all of our problems. Okay? Not just occasionally, or sometimes, but always. True Christianity never involves failure. Yes, there'll be times that we struggle. There'll be times that we fall down, but he picks us up. He picks us and puts us right back into the fight. We, he always causes us to triumph. It, in true Christianity invariably reaches its goal. What are the goals of a true Christian? Eternity with Christ Jesus. Eternity. Sure, there will be struggles. There will be happenings. There will be hunger. There will be tears. But there will always be the triumph. We need to understand that tonight. All of us are true believers, and we all go through trial, but we triumph over it. God doesn't let it pull us down. We don't turn around and walk away. Yesterday, I had the privilege of attending a breakfast with several of the pastors here in the area. There were 11 of us. And every pastor, every one of them, asked the same question. He said, our congregation, after the virus hit, after the corona hit, and we had to close the churches, half of our congregation has never come back. Every one of the pastors, self-included, stated, part of our congregation has never come back. What's happening? What's happening? One of the pastors said, after a while, they get out of the habit of coming to church, so they just don't come back. But they find other things to do on Sunday. 
And he happened to say, several of my that have not come back got together and all of them went to Vegas to spend the whole weekend at Vegas. They've been out of church long enough that it just didn't bother anymore. Folks, we need to pray, really pray, that the church will be awakened. Those, that, and I'm not saying that's our people. I don't know what they're doing. I've called, on, I've called several of them. They tell us, Pastor, when this is over, right now we don't want to come to church. We're afraid to be around other people. When it's over, we'll be back. But that's happening all over the city, folks, to our churches. God's strategy is so much better for our victory. Isaiah 55, 9 for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's taking care of it, folks. Let's don't try to figure it out. That's what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Folks, we can't figure out what's going on. We don't know how long this will last. We don't know if the church will be raptured before it's over. But God says, don't try to figure it out. Just trust him. Stay true. Stay true. And trust him. Okay, I ask you again to look at the Apostle Paul as he was held prisoner in Rome, changed night and day to one of Caesar's, Caesar's, imperial guards. I love this portion of scripture. First time I really read it and the Lord began to speak to my heart on it. I ask you to think with me. The apostle Paul chained every day to the wrist of another young man. There's a chain keeping him together so that he couldn't leave. Walking all day, six hours a time. They had shifts, six hours a time, okay? Walking with Paul. What do you suppose Paul talked about? What did he talk about? Jesus. What he always talked about. Okay. The reasonable young man, the cream of the crop, chained to his arm. He's telling them about Jesus. They were handpicked by Nero to guard Paul. Like I said, six hours a day. Six hours a day. Can you imagine as Paul begins to tell them some of the things he had done, the things that he had seen? Can you imagine the questions that must have come? But Paul continued. Okay. And what do you think they talked about? What do you think happened to them? Okay. Paul could not go out into the city to preach. He could not visit the churches he had founded. So he preached to his guards. Philippians 1 Verse 12 and 13. Philippians 1, verse 12 and 13. Let me reach it. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the Gospels, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. But listen to verse 14 again. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my by bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Okay. Paul is telling us that he was preaching in the palace. Preaching in the palace. Who is he preaching to? Those that are chained to his arms. Sharing Jesus Christ with them. Okay. Unvarying success. He always causes us to triumph. The third thing, unforgettable impact. The true Christian is, has a sweet fragrance under the God of Christ. True Christianity, lived as it ought to be, is a sweet fragrance to God and man. 
philosophy. I have often said, if you spend much time with God, men are going to know it. Now stop and think about it. If you spend uh, much time, a lot of time with God, reading your Bibles, praying, sharing the gospel, people around you are going to know. There's something, as I said earlier, there's something different about these people. They don't seem to be sad. Yea, they have troubles, but it doesn't seem to pull them down. What is it? What an opportunity to share Jesus Christ in that situation. True Christianity when it is encountered, leaves an unforgettable impression. The fourth thing, sincerity. Look at verse 17, 2 Corinthians 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we Christ. I remind you again, there are many professing Christians professing Christians, preaching and teaching portions of the Bible, portions of the Bible, subjects that will attract people unto their own way of life. Sharing scripture that makes it look like, well, let's take the example of prosperity. If you're really a Christian, and that teaching is starting to revive again, if you're really a Christian, then you won't have any problems. You can pray and whatever you ask for, you'll get it. Prosperity preaching. Folks, that's not what the Bible tells us. It's not what the Bible says. God didn't promise to make us wealthy. He didn't promise to make us rich. He didn't promise every one of us a mansion on earth. He didn't promise a new car in every garage. He did promise to meet our needs to meet our needs. I love Matthew chapter 6. Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this will be added to you. What things is he talking about? Food, clothing, a house to live in, the personal things like that. Not Cadillacs or Mercedes or mansions. We got a, we got a great room in heaven. A great room. I was teasing Brother Jim a D Sunday. We were talking about it. And <clears throat> he said, you know, the Bible doesn't say that everyone's going to have a mansion. But we'll all have a room in the mansion. And I said, yeah, Ruth and I talk about it quite a bit. And we're asking God that we, our, our room could be next door to each other. Okay. So we could still be together. But folks, we do have a place in heaven prepared for us. Let's praise God and thank him for it. Paul says that true Christian is sincere. People are going to know you can't, you can't fake true Christianity. Can't be done. People see right through it. But if we're sincere, they will also see that. Commissioned by God, Given a definite tax, task, we are all purposeful people with an end in view, a goal to accomplish. Every one of us as true believers have a goal to accomplish. And that goal is to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we do it in the sight of God, knowing that God sees and hears all that we do, and we must give an account of ourselves unto him. Now that I want to just spend a little time sharing with you. Every one of us, the Bible says every one of us are going to stand before God and give an account of ourselves. Once we're raptured in heaven and in him, we're there. So when we're standing before God giving an account, that's not going to be about our sins. It's going to be about why did we do what we did? Are we serving God for what we can get out of it? Are we serving God for the praise of man? Are we serving God because it makes us look important? That's what's going to be judged. Why did we do what we did? Did we do it to please God? 
Did we do it to truly win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or did we do it for the praise of men? Or did we do it because the pastor asked us and we didn't want to say no to the pastor? Or did we do it because we love God and want to serve him? Every one of us were given account of ourselves before the Lord. Do you believe the story about Jesus changing water into wine? Now, I read an article about a, an alcoholic that had gotten saved, gotten delivered from alcohol. Before he got saved, as soon as he got pre paid, he would go out and start drinking. Him and a few of the, the men that worked with him or other friends, they would go out and start drinking. Sometimes he would drink all, almost all night. Many times he'd come home, no money. He had just gotten paid, but no money. He would get to drinking, then he'd start buying drinks for the other people, other men that were with him. And he finally ended up broke. Okay. But one day, he found Jesus Christ. He got saved. And God instantly delivered him. Instantly. And one of his friends asked him, why don't you go out with us anymore? Why aren't you going and having drinks and, and fellowshipping with us after work on payday? Why aren't you doing it? And so he told him, Jesus changed my life. He saved me. He really changed my life. He tried to witness to the man. And the man asked him this, do you really believe the miracles of the New Testament? He said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you believe the story about Jesus changing water into wine? He said, I sure do. I really do. He said, how can you believe such nonsense? He said, I'll tell you how. Because in our house, Jesus changed whiskey into furniture, into clothing, into food for my family. Yes, I believe in it. That's reality. Jesus changed my life, and now I can support my family. I can get the things that we need, and I'm no longer waking up with hangover every day. Yes, I believe. The fifth one, unmistakable marks of true Christianity. Unquenchable optimism. Unvarying success. Unforgettable, um, pardon me, unforgettable impact. True sincerity. True sincerity. That's what it is. Undeniable reality. May we, as Christians, as brothers and sisters in the body, may we strive for these points. May we strive that others will see these things in our lives and want to come to know the Lord that we are serving. They're there for us as we grow in the Lord. You remember I asked, how much time do we really spend reading our Bibles and praying? As we grow in the Lord through these things, this is going to happen to us. And other people, you won't have to carry a sign. You won't have to wear a cross around your neck. And please don't miss this. There's nothing wrong with that. But you won't have to have that to show that I'm a Christian. You won't have to have little pins or things on you saying I'm a Christian. Your life, the example you set, tells us you're a Christian. It speaks to the lost. I really am a Christian. This was made real to me years ago while I was just, just a little bit before coming here as your pastor. I was working a job. I was a supervisor in the company, but I had to work the night shift, the graveyard shift. And I was in charge of the whole plant, and I was the only one there as a supervisor. So if somebody wasn't going to come to work, they called in, and I would have to take the call. And there was one guy that, just a habitual, he just wouldn't come to work on times. He'd get to, just like I was talking, he'd get to drink it and wouldn't come to work. So after a while, 
the president gave him a written warning. He told him one more of these and you won't have a job. We hired you because we need you. You have to be at work. So a few weeks went by and he didn't show up for work. He didn't call in or anything, he just didn't show up. So when he came in, the next time, they took him into the office. They began to question him and told him, you didn't even call in. He said, yes, I did, I called in. But he said, that, that supervisor on the night shift, he got mad and he cussed me out over the phone. Well, I didn't know it. I knew the, the president knew me. And he knew my work. But I didn't know that he was watching my life. And he said to him and to the union representatives, he said, I know that man. He said, he's a believer. He doesn't use that language. He doesn't talk like that. He lost his case. The guy lost his case. That spoke volumes to me. It reminded me, people are watching us. We, not, we may not even be aware of it, but they're watching us. How then are we living? How are we living? Father, tonight I come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I have shared what you have put upon my heart. You are calling out to the church in this hour. When I speak of the church, I mean the total church, not Bethany only, the total church. You are calling out to your church, calling us to raise the standard, to really be what we are professing to be. So Lord, I'm asking, may the Holy Spirit quicken this truth to every one of our hearts. May the desire of our heart be that others see Jesus in me. I ask it tonight in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.